a tabernacle. The meaning of the word tabernacle that you see in the scripture means a dwelling place. God chose to find, make a dwelling place. God chose to reveal uh, uh, plans to Moses to build a dwelling place so that he can come and dwell among his people. As I said way back in the beginning, God's heart, heart is always for his people. According to the Jewish sages, according to the Old Testament, if you ask these people who understand the God of the Old Testament, they say the God of the Bible is a God who pursues each and every one of us. Many times we feel that we are pursuing God, but we are wrong, my friends. It's God who pursues us. Sometimes we say, I accepted the Lord. No, you didn't accept the Lord. The Lord accepted you. That's what has happened. God has chosen us before the foundations of this world were laid to be a part of his kingdom, to be a part of his body. That's the marvelous thing that has happened all throughout history. We can see how God longed to dwell among his people and God chose to dwell uh, in this particular structure called the tabernacle. It's a very interesting structure. If you look at the details, it's amazing. So we started, started off by understanding the linen fence, the altar of sacrifice, the labor, different components of the colors and the gate and everything we're talking about. If you see the entrance for the tabernacle, the first two things that you see is an altar and a labor, and that's where the relationship of a believer is established. A person in order to enter this place where God said, you can come and have fellowship with me, the first thing he has to encounter is this altar of sacrifice where an animal is sacrificed for the sins uh, that they have committed. So the Christ is the ultimate sacrifice, and there's no way we can have relationship with God besides Christ. So that's the picture of this entry because of uh, what Christ has done. The first step is relationship is established and the next stage is where the fellowship is established with God. That's the inner sanctuary. It's very important for us to understand that's a progression for us to get into the fellowship of God. He cannot experience the intimacy with Christ or intimacy with God without understanding cross itself. We cannot experience the fellowship that we can get with God without understanding what cross is. A missionary once said, God is not so much concerned as to what, uh, with what I do as with what I am. For doing comes from being. In order to do service for the Lord, in order to do ministry, in order to be something good for the Lord, we need to have fellowship. And without fellowship and intimacy with God, there is no way we can do good things for the Lord. We no way we can be of service to God. So the doings come from the being. The being, being in God, being in his presence, having fellowship with him day in and day out. That's the only way to do it. So we looked at this structure of a tabernacle, bronze altar, a person passes, that's the first point of entry, then the labor, then they go into the, something called the holy place, where there's three objects there, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and the menorah, which is the lampstand. So we talked about uh, bronze altar, labor, but the table of showbread last week, and the table of showbread symbolizes the word of God, how a person needs to feed on the word of God. And today we're going to look into the altar of incense. So as you see, there are two altars. One is the bronze altar, which signifies cross, and one is, the, uh, one is the altar of incense, which talks about prayer. Incense signifies prayer of the saints. So here is a picture for you. Altar of incense signifies the prayer of the saints. So when uh, the priest puts on uh, incense upon the altar, it goes into God's presence. It says a pleasing aroma unto his throne. So there's no way we can have this intimacy through prayer without going through the first altar, the altar of sacrifice. So remember this concept through this whole sermon here. The altar of in incense symbolizes the prayer of the saints. And our prayers ascend to God at this altar of incense. Let's look at the construction and the structure of this. And an altar of incense is located very next to the holy of holies or the most holy place. It is uh, separated by a curtain. It's a very interesting thing. Out of all the objects, the bronze altar is on the east side and the altar of incense is the closest to the holy of holies. That's where it's situated, right in the center of the holy place. And this is what the Lord said to Moses and their instructions regarding building this structure. He said, make an altar of acacia wood for burning incense. 
It is to be a square, a cubit long, a cubit wide, and two, cu two cubits high. It, its horns of one piece with it. Overlay the top of all the sides of the horns with pure gold and make a gold molding around it. Make two uh, gold rings for the altar below the molding, uh, two on opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. Make poles of acacia wood and over the, overlay them with, with gold. Then he says, put the altar in the front of the curtain, and that is before the ark of the testimony, before the atonement cover, that is over the testimony where I will meet you. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every, uh, every uh, morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight, so the incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. And he gives a final instruction. He says, do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering, and do not pour a drink offering on it. God was very specific about this altar. Sometimes when you read the scripture, you might say, oh, it's boring. Okay, we don't understand what it is. Well, we'll just read through it anyway. So what is the significance of this golden altar? Let's understand through the scripture. It is the smallest of the structures here. It's uh, 18 inches square. It's not big. And its height is three feet high. It's higher than the Ark of the Covenant, which is there in the Holy of Holies. And it's higher than the table of showbread by nine inches. It is made up of pure gold. It is covered, it's acacia wood covered with gold. And it has four horns on the top. And it has uh, two golden receptacles for two poles to pass through so that when people carried, they just carried it on their shoulders and they were not supposed to touch the object. And uh, it had a golden rim on the edge, just like the um, table of showbread. And uh, this gold and this wood always symbolizes, as I said again and again, the wood symbolizes, acacia wood symbolizes the humanity of Christ and gold symbolizes the deity of Christ. So this symbolizes Christ where it's gold, it's wood covered by gold, molded with gold. And this is uh, the structure of this altar of incense. And how is this significant? Let's see what happens here. Every time they had to burn incense, this altar had uh, burning coals, altar of incense had burning coals on top, but the incense was on the table of showbread. They had to, the priest, the high priest, had to take the incense from the table of showbread and he had to walk towards the altar of incense and pour it upon the coals and then only the incense comes alive. So last time we saw that the table of showbread is the word of God. And I said incense symbolizes the prayers of the saints. Here is one of the base, basic simple formulas for prayer, my friends. Our prayers should be based upon the word of God. Our prayers need to be based upon the word of God. Where does the priest carry the incense from? From the table of showbread. From there the prayers proceed and then he puts it upon the altar. So prayers, no matter what we pray, we cannot pray against the will of God. We got to know what the will of God is and we got to pray accordingly. And Christ is a good example of being a high priest. This priest, the Bible says, we just read the passage, this incense had to be going on continuously. They had to be day in and day out, it had to be, it had to be uh, kept on going. And Bible says that Jesus Christ is our intercessor. Jesus Christ is our high priest. If you read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, we'll probably not have a clue as to what we're reading without understanding what a tabernacle is. There's so much of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, that is filled with Christ's role as an intercessor. This is what the Bible says. In Hebrews chapter um, 9, verse 24, this is what it says. For Christ has not entered the holy places with man-made hands, which are the copies of the true. So the Old Testament is a shadow, and the New Testament is a reality. So the tabernacle is a shadow of Christ himself. 
So Christ, the Bible says, Christ not entered the holy place with man-made hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. So Jesus Christ, as a high priest, entered the holy place into the presence of God. And then let's see what he has done. Hebrews 7, 5 says, For therefore he is able to save those from the utmost to those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Christ is our intercessor. There is a continuous burning of incense at the altar which the high priest had to maintain. And Jesus Christ, as our intercessor, he keeps this altar of incense alive. What do I mean by that? He prays for us regularly and intercedes for us continuously. And this is what the Bible says further. In 1 John 1.21, it says, My dear children, I write to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, We have the one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Christ is our intercessor. Christ is our defense. And again, Romans 8.34. Who is he that condemns? This is what I want to ask you uh, and ask you as a Seaside Community Baptist Church. Is anybody condemning you for your sin? My friends, if you're truly repented and you've been beaten down by people, I'm sorry to say the people are beating you down are doing the wrong thing. Because you have confessed your sin and you're living a life of transformation. And if you are in Christ, if you're a true born again believer, you're no longer prone to condemnation. Because condemnation only comes from unbelievers or even sometimes some Christians. And there's only one person in the Bible who's named an accuser. That is the devil himself. He accuses us constantly. And if you accuse somebody, you're acting like the devil itself. So be careful with that. And Bible says, he, uh, who is he condemns? Christ Jesus who died more than that, he, who raised from life, he's at the right hand of God, and is also what? Interceding for us. If the world, and if Christians, if the devil himself, after you become a born again believer, putting your faith in Christ, trying to live a righteous life, and the world comes and points his fingers at you, and Christians point your fingers and, uh, at you and say, you are a condemned man, you are guilty, you're, yes I'm guilty, yes you're condemned, yes you're all this, but thanks to Jesus Christ for what you've done, for what he has done on the cross, that you're no longer condemned, you're no longer Uh, uh, guilty of what he committed because there is Christ who's interceding in the presence of of God for our behalf. So this morning probably you're sitting here, probably we messed up something last week. You're sitting so convicted and say, Lord, I feel so guilty about what what I've done. I confess, I admit, and you feel that condemnation keeps coming and attacking you and putting you down on your face. And if you're truly repentant in God's presence, God's Holy Spirit will lift you up and give you the peace and say, Son, you are free. As far as the east is from the west, your sins I have separated from you. You are free and you're guiltless. And Bible says he'll remember our sin no more. And that's the beauty of God's promise, my friends. That's the beauty of God's love. Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Sometimes... God forgives our sins, or every time God forgives our sins, we don't forgive ourselves. That is self-righteousness. That is pride. How can we uh, nullify or negate the work of the cross? The power of grace, the power of mercy, the power of Christ's intercession is so strong that nothing could stand for a believer. Nothing in the world can accuse you of your sin. You are free because of what Christ has done. You are free because of what Christ is doing. Experience the freedom in Christ Jesus because the Bible says, he that the sun set frees is free indeed. Amen. Everybody say amen. amen. What a joy it is to know there is one who is interceding. The brazen altar talks about the crucifixion of Christ. This is where the lamb was slain. I talked about this. Listen to the series in the sermon. The brazen altar talks about crucifixion. The altar of incense talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It talks about how he continuously is a living God, is alive. That's why in the Bible when you see God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He doesn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is a God of the living. And God is, he is, he's the great I am. He's alive today. That's the beauty of it. Even at this time, around 11.20, God is seated on the throne. That will not change, my friends. 
Isn't that great hope that is there that he is watching everything that you're going through and he is alive today in God's presence interceding for us. So crucifixion, the altar of sacrifice, talks about the redemption and reconciliation. A person needs to be born again without which he cannot experience the fellowship with God. There needs to be redemption and reconciliation. Then only we can experience the intercession or the intercession for the redeemed. As born again believers, we need those prayers. We need that intimacy with God. And Christ does it as an intercessor for the redeemed. Romans 5.10 says this. For if when we are God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of the son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Because of Christ's life, because Christ being alive, we can experience this reconciliation with God. My friends, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said he doesn't carry life, but he is life itself. So when he died on the cross, when they put him on the grave, how can death hold life? There's no way death can hold life. Christ had to come out alive. And because of the resurrection power, we are reconciled into, God, into God's family, into the relationship with him. So Christ saves us from, from our condemnation of sin at the altar. But everything that contaminates after you become a born again believer, in this, as long as you live in this world, that is taken care of in our daily life at the altar of incense because of the intercession that takes place in Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus. Hebrews 7, 25 says this, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. What a beautiful promise. He always lives to intercede for them. Now, how is this altar related to our prayer life? We heard that Christ is our intercessor. So how is this related to our prayer life? You see, the position and the place where the altar of incense is, is a place which is the closest to the Holy of Holies. That's the central object in the, in the, in the, in the tabernacle enclosure. The way that you can get close to God without getting into the Holy of Holies, the closest place one can be is at the altar of incense. There's table of showbread on the right, menorah, the lampstand on the left, but the altar of incense is right next to the curtain of the Holy of Holies. So a believer, a priest, can walk as close to God as possible through prayer. The only way we can experience this intimacy is through prayer. The only way we can experience this, uh, this deep fellowship that we can have with God is through prayer. And we said the incense had to be kept burning continually. There's twice a day where the, the priest puts incense, but there's a, the need, it needs to continuously burn in the presence of God. And Bible says in uh, Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. God gives us instructions as believers in Christ to pray continuously without ceasing. The original Greek word that was used is used in the context of coughing. I was coughing a lot last week. And if you look at a cough, if you do an analysis of a cough, you don't have one long cough, do you? <clears throat> no, you don't have that. Maybe, some people do. You don't have a long, drawn-out cough, but cough comes periodically, in stages, in steps, um, with continuous breaks here and there. And that's the term that was used to describe to pray without ceasing. God wants short outbursts of prayer constantly. That is the meaning of the word praying without ceasing. Yes, there are times there's special attention given to the altar of incense twice a day where they had to put incense. There need to be a special time for us to pray. But at the same time, during the course of the day, when you're working, when you're driving, you need to have this short outburst of cough. So if you get a cough, it's a good thing to remember that you got to pray continuously. All right, so that's a beautiful picture that uh, Christ draws through this. And a few examples of, of prayer warriors in the Bible who interceded with God constantly and they persisted in praying without ceasing. One of them is Samuel. Israelites, they said, okay, every other kingdom has a, has a king. Samuel was a prophet. They came to him and said, we need a king. Uh, and Samuel says, you don't need a king. God is your king. He said, no, no, we need a king. 
So when people asked for a king, they got Saul. But when God gave them a king, they got David. When you ask for something, you may not get the right thing, but when God gives you, you'll get the best one. So, but when they're repentant of the situation, they come to Samuel and say, oh, we made a mistake in asking for a king. Would you pray uh, that the Lord's will would not burn us or destroy us? And Samuel says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Samuel says an interesting thing. If you don't pray for others, he calls it sin. Uh, very important thing to remember. My friends, sometimes when I hear prayers, or even myself, I spend probably 20 minutes just praying for myself. And I feel that I don't do enough justice praying for others sometimes. And Bible says, if I don't pray for others, I'm sinning. That's what Samuel is hinting here. Do we pray for others? Do we pray for others' needs rather than our own? It's very important that Samuel wants us here. Paul says, he, he's talking to the church in Colossae, he says this, for this reason, since we, the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the spiritual wisdom and understanding. God wants us to pray continuously, and, and Paul uh, is an example right there. He says, I, I never stop praying for you. He never stopped coughing in prayer. That's what I mean. He continuously prays for this church in Colossae. And the, one of the other wonderful examples is the intercessory prayer of Abraham. God wanted to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, in Genesis 18, there's a whole record of what happens. God, uh, Abraham falls in, on his face and intercedes with God. So he said, Lord, if there are 50 righteous people, would you not destroy uh, this city? He said, yes, God says. If I find 50 people, I will not destroy the city. And then Abraham began to calculate, and he said, okay, Sarah, Jane, and began to calculate all the names, and he realized there are not 50 righteous people in Sodom, and immediately he, he changed the tone. He said, God, what about 45 people? Would you, would you destroy the city if there are 45 righteous people? God says, no, I would not destroy if you find 45 people. Then he continues to bargain. He's a true Indian that way. He continues to bargain and says, God, if there are 10 righteous people, would you not destroy this city? God says, yes, if there are 10 righteous people, I would not destroy this city. But Abraham realized that not even 10 righteous people, and history says that God eventually destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was faithful in interceding for others. Our duty is to pray and leave the results up to God, but pray according to his will. That's what Abraham established right here. I wonder, what if Abraham said, Lord, if there's one righteous person, would you not destroy the city? I wonder what God's answer would be. I would think it's a yes. Anyway, that's only holy speculation. That's what it's called, okay? Don't, don't pounce on it and talk, call me a, uh, a wrong doctrine teacher, all right? Just leave it right there, what you just heard, okay? Let's move on here. The best example, the perfect classic example of intercession is seen through the life of Moses. God says to Moses, what a wonderful scripture. It's one of my favorites here. Moses prayed for the people in spite of the fact that God had said, now leave me alone so that my anger might burn against them that I might destroy them. Here are these Israelites, they come out of Egypt, they keep complaining, grumbling constantly, and God says, Moses, you don't pray anymore. Whenever you pray, I begin to change, so don't pray anymore. That's the kind of attitude you see here. Leave me alone, Moses, so that I can destroy these people because my anger is heavy against them. I want to destroy them. Then I'll make you, you Moses, I'll bless you and make you a great nation. Don't worry about all those. If I was there, I would have thought, okay, Lord, you, you want to destroy all those, but you want to bless me? Okay, I would like the blessing. Let me be a little selfish here. Okay, do whatever you want. Bless me though. I would say that probably. But Moses, see what he says. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Oh Lord, he said, he started his speech. Why should your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of Egypt with your great power and your mighty hand? He's starting his bargaining power here. Whom you brought out of Egypt, you brought your people out with your mighty hand, with your outstretched arm. He's trying to remind God of what he has done. And then he continues to say, why should the, uh, the Egyptians say, 
It was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains to wipe them out of the face of the earth. See how he's bargaining here? It's like, oh, you brought them all out to kill them in this wilderness. That's what the Egyptians will say. And then he continues to say, turn from your fierce anger, relent and do not bring disaster upon your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac and Israel to whom you swore by your own self. I'll make your descendants as as numerous as the stars in the sky. I'll give you your descendants all this land I promised to them and I'll be their inheritance forever. Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. That is quality prayer, my friends. That's the way to pray, where you can turn God's heart. Prayer is the way, yes, God is sovereign, but he likes to see us pray because you see the sovereign hand of God right there. He spared an entire nation because of one man who just tried to bargain with him and reminded what he has done in the past. What an awesome picture. It's another instance where uh, there's a battle that is going on with Joshua and the Amalekites. The Israelites were fighting the Amalekites. God tells Moses to, to go on to the top of a mountain and lift his hands. And whenever he was lifting up his hands, they were winning the battle. Whenever his hands became weak, they were losing the battle. They were coming down. So they had two people hold up Moses' hands. This is recorded in the Bible. Another picture of intercession. Every time you lift up your hands, when the cops come and say, hands in the air. You know why they say that? That's an expression or indication of surrender. I give up. That's what hands in the air means. So when you give up, God can take up. That's what he wants. And here is Moses says, we give up, Lord, as Israelites. Now you win the battles for us. That is intercession. The greatest ministry in any Christian office between the preaching, between ushering, between serving, being a teacher, being whatever. The greatest ministry, listen to this, is prayer. The greatest ministry one can do is not service, it is prayer. The biggest battles that need to be fought are on our knees, that's through prayer. Because Bible says in Ephesians 6, 12, For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the rulers of this darkness, of this dark age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Do not underestimate the power of prayer. If two people come up to me this morning and ask one guy, what did you do for the Lord's service? The guy says, I built 100 churches. The other guy says, I spent eight hours a day praying. If I think in a rational Christian business mentality, the guy who built a hundred churches is a better guy compared to the guy who spent hours and hours doing nothing but just praying. How dare we say just praying? My friends, the biggest battle that are being, is being, which is being fought is by the person who is on his knees. The one thing I stress right from the beginning with Seaside Community is prayer is a, a priority here. And without prayer, this church will not thrive. Without prayer, this church will not thrive, period. The reason why we are sitting here and having a good time listening to the word and we are being blessed through the singing, through the fellowship with one another, the reason why all this is happening is because of the prayer times that we are having Sunday night and because of the prayer that people are putting in to the church during the course of week through the intercessory team. You want to see results. Pray, for the battle is not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against the physical thing. We're not fighting against the materialistic stuff. We are fighting a battle with an unseen enemy in an unseen realm, and that is the battle we need to fight, and that's the greatest ministry that one could do, and it has the greatest, it has the greatest responsibility. The altar of sacrifice symbolizes the sacrifice. It's a deed. It's done once for all. At the cross, we're done once for all. But we move on to the altar of incense. It's an act of obedience and an act of fellowship. Sacrifice is done, but prayer is, requires obedience. And God says, obedience is better than sacrifice. We need to be obedient to pray. We need to be obedient to have the communion with the Lord. As you see the four horns on this altar of incense, the four horns signify the prayers from all four directions, the four directions that exist. And on occasions, 
They apply blood upon these horns on this, uh, on this uh, altar of incense, and that signifies that through the sacrifice of the lamb that the prayers are being answered. So that's why whenever we pray, we say in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray, and everybody say amen. We can only pray through what Christ has done. And that's the only way prayers are heard. And horns in the Bible also signify one other thing. They signify power. They signify power. And there's great power in prayer, my friends. In India, we learned a simple statement. It says, more prayer, more power. No prayer, more power. Maybe it's from here. I don't know. When I first came here, I became shocked when people complained, oh, they took away prayer from schools. I said, where is the prayer in the church? You complain about schools, but where is the prayer in the church? And God says, prayer is power and has to come from all four directions. We need to pray until that time we cannot see a breakthrough. One other important stuff here. When, the, when they bought the priest made an incense, he had a little recipe that he had to follow. I'll try to need, read these things out. It's called statica, onkia, galbanum, frankincense, seasoned with salt. Sounds like a recipe from a Canadian living magazine, is it? All right. But God had a specific composition. He needed a specific mixture. If they offered profane fire, if they offered a profane mixture, you know what happened? They were cut off, they were killed right away. What does this mean? What does this imply to a believer? When we pray, my friends, it's not just beating about in the air, praying whatever we want. It is required that it's aligned with God's specific ordinances through his promises and through his will. It has to be a right composition. Composition. Did I say that right? Okay. So if we have wrong combination of our prayers, sometimes these prayers can be used as judgment against us. I'll repeat. If we pray the wrong prayers, these prayers can be used by God as judgment against us. Show you the scripture. Psalm 80, 4 to 5 says, The Lord God of, O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry against the what? Prayer of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears and you've given them tears to drink without measure. God answered their prayers and gave them tears to drink, it seems. Hmm, that's interesting. I thought every prayer is a good thing. No matter what we pray, God answers everything. Or sometimes he doesn't choose to answer, we just pray anyway. No, my friends. If we don't pray properly, according to the scripture, God can give us the tears to drink. It's a dangerous, dangerous thing. It's very important we understand the significance of praying right. There are some times in my life where I had situations, I'll explain this with an example. There's a person in India, say he is dying, he or she is dying. Terribly sick, good Christian, godly man, everything, but he's dying. What should I pray for for this situation? So I go there, and so, okay, it's good for you to die and be in the presence of the Lord. Would I say that? Probably not. I wouldn't go and say, Lord, heal him and make him complete. Would I say that? Maybe not. But I need, need to know what the Lord's will in this situation is. I would pray, may your will be done in this person's life. What if God says, this person has done his job, he's done his ministry, now I need him with me in my presence. What if that's God's plan? And what if you go and say, no, don't let him die, heal him, bring him back. You know what happens? God can answer your prayer, but you've got to live with the consequences. There's one uh, instance in the Bible where, a, where there is a king. He says, Lord, yeah, the Lord reveals through a prophet that he's going to die. And the king pleads, he says, please don't kill me, I want to live longer. And God answers his prayer. He lives a little longer. But during this longer lifespan, he gives birth to a son who's supposed to be one of the most disgusting character in the Bible who brought upon curse upon an entire nation. Yes, you can get your prayers answered, but we got to live with the consequences. God has his will. Pray right. We need to understand what God's will is for that person. There are some people tell me to pray for a particular situation. I pray and then I stop. 
I don't continue praying anymore because I want to be as careful as possible what the Lord's will in that particular situation is. But if it aligns with the scripture, then I pray it. If the Lord wants me to grow in the understanding and knowledge of his, of his Savior, I would pray continuously for that. I wouldn't stop for that. This is not something to know what your will is, for what God's will is. Some people pray, it's like, did, uh, if I get an invitation to preach, say in uh, New Minus and in Florida, two invitations at the same time, my flesh says, go to Florida, right? But my spirit, if God is leading me, say, go to New Minus. You know, there's a battle that happens constantly. When there are two options at the same time, that's when I pray. But if there's one option, I got to preach somewhere, I go and preach anyway. I know that's the Lord's will for me to preach the word of God. That's what he called me for. I just wait a minute, let me wait for 10 years and find out. I don't wait. I got to do the job. It's very important, my friends. We got to pray right prayers. And incense coming to an altar of incense signifies that. There's one particular day called the Day of Atonement where the high priest puts to use the incense to the highest level. One day in a year, the high priest enters the holy of holies, the most holy place where people are forbidden to enter God's presence. But whenever he enters, he has to take an incense with him. This is what the Bible says about it. Then shall take a censer full of burning coals from the fire, from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense, beaten fine, bring it inside the veil. Then he'll put the incense on the fire uh, before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that, uh, that is on the testimony, lest he die. The only way we can approach God to that deep intimacy, to the depth of the core of his heart is through prayer. And there's no other way. And we need that absolute presence of God. We need that incense so full to enter into God's glory. And that's the only way he's going to reveal his heart of hearts. That happens through the incense. Coming to the final point here. The altar of incense has a relationship with the trumpets. The altar of incense has a significance with the Feast of Trumpets. I did a seven-part series here. It's there online if you get a chance to listen to that. It's a tremendous God's agenda that he has shown in the scripture that for, that's meant for every believer. There are seven feasts that God gave to Israel, and he calls them my appointed times, called the Moedim, God's timing for his people. The Passover, the unleavened bread, and first fruits and Pentecost, these first four feasts were fulfilled during the first coming of Christ. The last three feasts are yet to be fulfilled. Are yet to be fulfilled. They are meant to happen. They have a significance with Christ. You'll understand more if you can listen to that. But this altar of incense has a connection with the feast of trumpets. What do I mean by that? Let me show you from this passage of Revelation that we read this morning. This is what John writes. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God. To, him, to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense. See all the terminology there. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayer of all the saints, uh, the prayer of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke from the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with the fire from the altar, threw it upon the earth. There were noises, their thundering, their lightning, earthquakes. So the seven angels who had seven trumpets prepared themselves for the sound. Here is a description of a tremendous event that is going to take place in those last days. This event has great significance, which is uh, showing the God's judgments upon the mankind which are yet to happen. But my friends, they're all happening based on the incense, based on the prayers of the saints. If that's how significant these prayers of saints are, how significant our prayers can be even today to see this nation come to Christ to see Tantalon or this area in the city of Halifax come to Christ. If only we can pray and understand the significance of the drastic, dramatic effects that it can have and produce in the presence of God, my friends, great, thing, great things can happen if only we believe and act in obedience at the altar of incense. We are living in a tremendous period of history 
and there's very, very significant uh, uh, importance given to prayer. And without prayer, we will not, we will not see results. And if you want to see a breakthrough in your own family, if you have an unsaved husband, if you have an unsaved child, if you have families that are not living for Christ, and if your child is, uh, is rebelling against you, living a sinful lifestyle, pray until you see something happen. There's a lady in India that I met. She uh, and her husband, they were both new believers. They lived in a small thatched house. And right in front of the house, the Hindus decided to build a big temple. And you know what she did? It's like, wait a minute. They cannot build a temple right in front of my house. So every day she got up early in the morning when the temple is locked. And she used to walk around uh, the temple and lay her hands in the name of Jesus. I pray that you remove this temple. And she did that for seven days. And that she heard the story of Jericho walls coming tumbling down. Simple faith. And once there was an earthquake, the whole temple was gone. My friends, that is prayer. Pray until something happens. Have this faith that knowing that God will do tremendous stuff. And that's exactly what God wants in Ephesians 6, 18. He says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the saints. I feel short of this so many times. I say, Lord, why can't I pray enough? And I feel miserable all the time. But my friends, I know the power of prayer. I know the effectiveness of prayer. Let me conclude with a little bit of my life from back in India. When I first became a Christian, I was 15 years old. I met Jesus Christ. I didn't know what born again was. I was playing for a Christian meeting in a youth conference. And the Holy Spirit power, the power of God was so strong that I began to bawl like a baby. I didn't know what happened. I said, what happened? I said, they said, you are born again. Oh, what is that? I had no idea what born again was. And I became saved. And for two years, I couldn't find anybody to pray with. I didn't even know how to pray for. But I was so passionate about God, I didn't know how to talk to him. The first evening I came back home, I said, oh, as Christians, we have to pray, so I don't know how prayer works. So I got in a room, locked myself, pushed the bed aside, and said, Lord, if you have to come, you need a standing space, right? So I pushed the bed aside, sat there, turned off the light just in case because of God's glory. If he's bright enough, I don't want the light to decrease his brightness. You know, so I had to turn off the light, sit in the dark and just wait. Okay, Lord, I want to start praying, but probably it'll take you a couple of minutes to come from heaven to here, so I'll wait. So I used to sit there and wait for him to come. Right? Half an hour, he's not there. I should just sit there and wait. And uh, then I thought, okay, probably you're here. I don't even know. Probably you're standing right next to me. But I say, I just came to say that, Lord, I love you. And thank you for coming and visiting me. That was my prayer time. That's what two years. That's what I did. Nothing else. Just sitting there waiting for him to come, trying to imagine what he looked like. And say, sometimes I used to even feel, okay, if you're standing here, let me try to touch you. I think I felt your cloak or something. That's how I was. And I prayed like that for two years. And finally, two years later, a friend came to me and said, Kamo, uh, I'm a born-again Christian too, and I like to pray. It's like, wait a minute. There's another guy who wants to pray. And I got so excited. We climbed the roof of our house, and we started praying every Friday, two of us. And he always prayed for his girlfriend. I was so upset with him. Because he had nothing else. Lord, uh, I want the right girl. It's like, wait a minute. We're coming to pray to God. And you're talking about your girlfriend. You're wasting my time. I was so upset because I wanted to know who this God is. And I kept praying. And finally, there are a bunch of guys who started coming together. So we want to pray too. And we became, uh, we used to meet every Friday. A bunch of us guys started with seven guys. Just came together. Said, let's pray. So then people began to call us the Friday band. Friday prayer band. And all we did was, he said, since I played guitar, they said, oh, come on, you lead praise and worship. I said, what is that? He said, praise means fast songs, worship means slow songs. Okay, I got it. Okay, so that's what I did. It's praise and worship, then praying. He said, we didn't even know what to pray for. And I never prayed in public. But there's one instance, probably some of you are sitting like me here. No, I can pray in my bedroom, but I can't pray in public. There's one prayer meeting that I went to because I was so hungry to pray, but I could pray by my little mumble and do all that. And the leader of the prayer meeting said, okay, time for prayers. We're all kneeling down. He said, 
uh, okay, come on, we'll lead us in prayer. It's like, oh, man. I'm g-. Then I, I closed my eyes, blocked my ears, and acted as if I didn't hear what he said. So I was just uh, praying away by myself, and I knew he said my name. So I slowly opened my eyes and looked at him, and he's like, he did this Indian thing. <laughs> yes, go ahead. It's like, oh, boy, now I'm in trouble. He was the only guy staring at me. Everybody was waiting for me. But as soon as he said that, he said, Lord, I don't know how to pray. I was so embarrassed. I didn't know what to do. But I started praying. I started praying, and I didn't know what I was doing. All of a sudden, all the people around me disappeared when I was praying. It was me and my God. And believe it or not, I was praying for 20 minutes nonstop. And by the time I was done, I realized it was not me who was praying. The Lord was helping me to pray. I was so delighted. From that moment, believe it or not, if somebody said, who wants to pray? Say, me, I want to pray. I was always looking for opportunities to get a chance to pray, my friends. And it was such a delight. And when you pray in India, you got to be loud because you can't hear yourself. When everybody, when you start praying, say, Lord, uh, do this. Yes, Lord, yes, do that. You know, everybody's screaming. It's like, wait a minute, what's going on here? So that's how we started. And there was noise in this. And when people say, pray for things, it's as if you want it now and you're desperate. When I, I didn't know much about the Bible either, I had King James Version. I used to turn it, say, the, uh, turn it and it says, the Lord's wisdom is pure, blameless, pure, uh, free from evil. I said, this, this is great. I want that wisdom, Lord. And I used to pray for an hour. I need that wisdom right now. Give me that wisdom. I used to fight until I got that. That was my prayer life. Nothing extraordinary. I'm not, uh, I don't know why you made me a preacher. I cannot even speak proper English. Look at Pastor Tim Fraser. Look at Pastor Dave Irvine. They speak extraordinary English. And they're so beautiful in what they say. And I can't even say that. But when I pray, I can't even pray the right things. But the Lord helps me to pray with the Holy Spirit power. Great things happen. My experience of learning about prayer I'll conclude with this. It's not from theologians and great scholars, my friends. I learned it from the tribal people back in India. These people, when they needed something for their church, say they needed a microphone, they would have an all-night prayer and a fasting prayer just to get a mic. And they pray in the rain, whatever, it doesn't matter. They just pray and God would finally give them a microphone they were able to purchase for, say, 50 cents. And the mic has a cord that you move it, it breaks. Uh, 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 you know, that kind of mic, it just breaks. But you should see the tears of joy and say, the Lord has answered our prayer and he has given us a microphone. And you see the excitement. I said, these people are persistent. So we used to do, as friends, we used to pray once a month. We used to have an all-night prayer. Some people used to be so tired, our friends used to be so tired from work, but they still came for all night prayer anyway. We used to pray and we used to sweat, and some people were so tired in order to fake them from uh, sleeping, they used to open their Bibles and fall asleep. To say, hey, are you sleeping? It's like, no, I'm reading my Bible. So why are you reading your Bible when we have to pray? And then we kept a bucket of water right next to us. Anybody sleeping, he's in trouble. There are times if guys were tired, you used to bring their bed inside the prayer room. They can sleep there, and all they had to do is keep saying, yes, Lord. Whatever it is, yes, Lord. That's what they had to do. They were friends of mine. They used to come to the prayer meeting, telling their parents who are non-Christians, Hindus, and say, we are going for prayer meeting. And they used to tell their parents that they're going for a movie, and they used to come for prayer meeting. And one instance... A guy, he was praying in the prayer meeting, a Hindu guy who came for all-night prayer because he was so excited for that. His dad came into the middle of the prayer meeting, a Hindu guy, began to drag him out of the prayers. How dare you come to a prayer meeting? He told them he's going for the movie, and he came for a prayer meeting because he wanted to be there. And while he was being dragged out of the room, he says, see you guys again, next prayer meeting, I'll be there. And he was so strong and so stubborn that nothing could stop him. Solid Christian. These are not ordinary fools, my friends. They tasted the love of God and nothing could separate them. And these tribal people, the one thing that really surprised me, they asked, what do you want us to pray for you? 
I said, okay, let me see what I can give. Immediately, my friend who was a missionary there said, come on, be careful what you tell them to pray for. I said, why? If you tell them your finger is paining and you pray, pray for that, they'll start praying for that. You go 10 years later and you ask them, are you praying for me? I said, we are praying for your finger pain. Then you got to tell them to stop praying. This is gone. This is all good. Here is a new prayer point. They will pray until you tell them to stop. So better give them good prayer points. Say, like, huh, amazing. That is prayer, my friends. That is what God expects. Persistent prayer. And see, my friends, seaside community will not be the same. I promise. Because based on God's word, if we pray and pour out our hearts before God, great and mighty things will happen. And God would use people like me who is no good for anything. God could do tremendous stuff to each and through each and every one of, of you here. So can we pray? Can we be people who understand the heart of God? If you're afraid to pray in public, if you're looking for those right words, forget about it. The Lord is give, going to give you the groans and utterances that you do not understand. The Holy Spirit will lead you in prayer. Pray the prayers that are based upon the word of God, based upon the will of God. And my friends, it will be a pleasing aroma in God's presence and in God's throne.